Let's, uh, let's, um, let's turn to the audience and uh, we'll take a couple of questions and then I'll summarize them and right down here in front, please. If we can get a microphone right here. Uh, Please, while we're waiting for the mic, go ahead. It's right here. I just, I just wanted to say, uh, right to that, what I'm saying is something which... Is it on? Yeah, wait just one second, please. I, I just wanted to add to what I just finished saying. The technology for this exists, has existed for centuries. It is not something that we don't know how to do. Um, and in pockets of practically every country, you will find this being practiced. Yeah. Um, therefore, it's not so much a question of, do we know how to do it? Yes, we do. Do we have the, the concern to do it is the question. To be institutionalized at yes. scale. Yes. Please, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, thank you. I, I think you are moderating one of the most important panels of this conference. And I say that because I've always had a passionate interest in education. Uh, I was Secretary General of the OECD, and I personally created the Education Department because we such, put such emphasis on it when I was essentially in the Canadian cabinet. Now, under that, you may know we, run a, we created a program at that time called PISA, which is a program mm -hmm. of international student assessment, which still plays an important role in allowing people to compare results. And they're pretty reliable because most countries don't change a lot in the scale. And this takes, you know, 250,000 was our first test. And now, of course, they're just looking at teachers. No, I'm not at the OECD now, but I think it's extremely important and, and, and early childhood education. Let me just make a, a personal comment as you were talking about your children. Yeah. Well, I was very fortunate in my own education because I grew up on a small farm in the Ottawa Valley during the war. I was born in 1936. My brother and I, by the time we got to school, which was a one-room schoolhouse, we could read, we could write, we could do arithmetic because of my mother. Now, one of the things we've got to think about when you talk about you're talking about good health, you're talking about good habits, think of how important the parents are in terms yeah. of early childhood education. Yeah. Because, you know, from then, we went to a, I went to a major public school, which was also good because people drawn from all walks of life and all races and all community downtown schools. We've lost a lot of that in the last 50 years. My point is that that early childhood education to which you refer is very important. Now, moving even to the university level, where I sat on the Principal's International Advisory Board at McGill, the big debate is, what are we educating people for? What right. jobs? Even at university, yeah. things are changing so quickly. And you heard uh, uh, Kamal Devrish this morning uh, point out that the technology is going to be such that in five years, we won't recognize the world today. Now, how do you train students for that? Yeah. And how do you train students so that they will not be displaced by AI, which is coming at us fast. The rapidity of changes today is incredible. So, so let's get our panels to react to that. Two great, so one is teachers. So the importance of teachers and parents as teachers. Well, that's my own experience with my mother, that's why. And, um, and the other is a little bit more on how we train, uh, how do we educate young people especially to take the onslaught of artificial intelligence and the speed at which things will change. Quickly comment, uh, you know that I totally agree with you about the, the family, especially vulnerable families, that uh, the lucky that you have uh, had, and everybody here probably, uh, most of the people here, should have their parents as teachers, uh, where the development happens. Um, the majority of the vulnerable population, they don't have this, because this, we do, we must uh, try to convince governments about how to help these people, vulnerable people, uh, in their homes, in their community. And the science is showing that this, if you do this with quality, you have good results. If you visit people in their homes and if you visit, visit them in their community, it's, it, this helps. And another thing, at least in Brazil, yes, teachers, uh, professors are really important, we do have a huge problem in Brazil because they are coming out of universities to teach young people uh, with only uh, 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 theory, not practical. Uh, and we are trying also to convince our policymakers in Brazil to change this. 
It's a huge resistance from university. Uh, they don't want to change the curriculum, but we are trying really hard to change because, you know, to teach young children, you have to, to know how to interact and everything. Uh, and they're very theoretical about it. Other thoughts? Please, Chen Ranjan. Um, so I, I can say a little bit from my own experience of, of this. We, we run programs in, um, in India which have the potential of reaching about 3 million children. Uh, in, uh, at various stages of life, um, early childhood and, and so on. Um, it's a large scale uh, system change at, at effort. Um, and we are essentially looking at um, shifting the teacher perceptions, not so much of, of course, their skills and so on, but much more of their role and their understanding of who they are and why they are there. We're trying to do that as teachers. At, what difference does that being make? Mm -hmm. What does it change in the society mm -hmm. if they are there? Mm -hmm. and, and that, it seems, makes a big difference to their abilities to both acquire fresh skills, but more importantly, to connect with the children in a way that's much more effective for them. Yeah. That's one thing that we do. Yeah. The second thing we do is to um, recognize that the teacher incapacity is a part of a larger systemic question of, of, of systemic incapacity, of, of leadership, et cetera, uh, across the entire system. So we work with, um, with officials who go all the way up to, from the, from the grassroots people, all the way up to the state officials who manage those systems, et cetera. And we basically say, everyone who manages that system needs to understand at least three types of leadership. We say, if you're running an education system, you must be able to provide pedagogical leadership. You must know why and how children learn and what's the best way of doing that. You must also be able to provide institutional leadership. Unfortunately, not very well done in, in our country, where most of them are treated essentially as postmen for passing on instructions back and forth. But we try to help them see that they are actually leaders, managers of, of those systems, which then creates a certain willingness and an interest, in fact, to um, not only help themselves in, yeah. in put, get, again, looking at their role as a different one from that of merely being a carrier of instructions from one side to the other. Yeah. The third thing we say is it's very important for all of these people to be able to exhibit community leadership. Um, we know that when communities get engaged with education, then children fare much, much better. Uh, we know that when they're not engaged, it's an uphill battle for everyone. Yeah. So how to connect with the, with the communities, et cetera, and, uh, and make them a part of the children's learning processes. Yes. That seems to, again, help a great deal. Um, as I said, our program potentially might, make, uh, might reach three, three million children. We don't think we reach, actually reach three million children, but we probably reached about 25%, which for us. Yeah, it's a pretty good number. Juliet? Teach them to read. Teach them to read. Teach them to read and limit the access to uh, electronic media on a daily basis would be my response. So uh, we've got a red flashing light at us. <laughs> um, we're, we're giving, uh, you know, we're, we're giving back a little bit of our time, um, I realize, in terms of how that clock started, but we're happy to do that. Um, let, me, let me just finish uh, with this thought. Um, oh, sorry, okay, we'll take one more. Yep. Depends on how, how much the organizers let me ignore this red flashing light. So right down here first. Oda Aberdeen, I sit on the boards of various educational entities, and we focus on the Mideast. My question to the panelists, when you have a society where one group demonizes the other, when you have politicians who demonize, that has a major impact on children, on young people, and how do we get, this, get rid of this demonization if we really want to have a society with healthy people who are, who are happy with themselves, who feel good about themselves? So it's a great question. How, how is it, you know, uh, 
we're very good at dividing each other and marginalizing groups. Uh, how do we how do we break down those? Uh, how do we stop that marginalization in order to create a greater good? Yeah, as, as we were saying earlier, uh, the question that we've been struggling with since morning today. Yeah, and in some ways, I would say our hope is the children. Um, we have seen again and again that even in society, the place I come from, deep divisions uh, on the basis of caste and backgrounds and so on and so forth. Uh, the adults won't talk to each other. The adults won't sit in the presence of each other. Children will mingle and play. The qu Unfortunately, what does happen is as the children grow up, they are socialized into the same sort of social mores and that eventually become like them. But I think if we could, if, if we have hope anywhere to create a, a more inclusive society, a, a more dialogic society, then I think it would make sense for us exactly doing that at, at the level when the children are young to help them develop a, the ability to see things as they actually are. This person is not necessarily a demon, uh, the one, one who's next to me, because he actually looks like me, works like me, thinks like me, feels like me. It's possible for children to see that. And the second, um, to try and see if we can build, not just, not build, I would say, retain the capacity for dialogue that the young children have. Uh, for a little bit longer. I mean, if if we can if we can take them to 20 years, I think we'd have we'd have we'd have done the done the job well. Let's take this last one right here, and then we'll and then we'll have to wrap up. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm so sorry to Virgin. I cannot let the one session about youth go without a young person talking. I am so sorry with Amen, all due respect. Amen. Go ahead. Um, I'm, um, I'm with the Generation Y. Um, I'm 32 years old and I work with the Generation Z, uh, with 15 to 20 years old. And although we thank you with, for all the efforts that you're doing for education on the long run, we need to solve many problems on the very, very short term. And in my experience, I think that um, education is a very complex problem uh, that will need many, many years to solve. But all the other programs that we can run at the same time with school, uh, whether it's extracurricular, STEM, arts, photography, anything, all the young people that I work with, they want to do things with their hands. They want to be involved, not in a classroom, getting information, not in front of a laptop, getting information, but doing stuff and making stuff and learning by doing. So please, if you can just shift uh, also your focus on the short-term goals as well. And thank you very much. Say, say something about short-term. That's yeah. a very important observation because uh, where children or even adults do things with their hands or create with their hands, it induces a sense of self-competence and accomplishment. And that in and of itself is a positive uh, development, social development factor. Um, and I think that I decry the, the loss of the opportunities for children to, to create pottery, sculpting, uh, engage in music, just, just the arts which give us as human beings, right from lay high to adulthood, that sense of being more than just what we are learning from our books. Other thoughts on short term? Well, just, just to say that learning by doing is, is the best way of learning there is. And of course, our young children, young people benefit greatly when, when we do that. Um, the connection of head, heart, and hands yes, is a very, very special one. And the short term and the long term do not have to be separated out. I think when the short, short term happens well, the long term follows. But I think it does need to be pursuant to a particular plan. It does need to, there needs to be a sense of where we are going. And I think that's what the long term does. And what needs to happen now, which is using the hands, is what the short term does. Yeah. Absolutely. Jordan, just just to, to finish up, uh, you're talking about social emotional skills, the learning by doing. Uh, it's, and one thing that I disagree with you, that I, I think we can't solve 
the educational problem in the short term. We do have to work hard uh, because everybody tell, tell us that, oh, education is too complicated, too ideological, but, you know, how many generations we're going to lose if we don't solve in the short term? I, I really believe, at least in Brazil, that we can, we can do solve the educational problem. Let me, uh, let me wrap with, with this thought. Um, even though we've got two former bankers here in the middle, um, I'm pretty confident in saying from three of us that work in the uh, human development field and one in the, the field of medicine, the answer to the question about how do we stop people from villainizing each other is make a commitment to equity. Um, you know, I, I, grew up in, uh, I grew up in a part of the U.S. that we talk a lot about today politically, former steel countries, standard oil, oil refineries. And back when I was growing up, we had, if you had an African American, a black American working next to a white American, working next to a Mexican American, all in U.S. steel, making $25 an hour, everybody was happy. There were 125,000 steel jobs in this part of uh, the region in the Midwest just outside Chicago. Today there are 3,000 jobs. And the, I went off to college, most of my friends went into the mills, and those are the, those are the populist movement today, and I'm a global elitist. Um, if we care as much about the path they took as the path I took, and especially uh, people of color or minorities in, in societies and focus on equity, and I'm now speaking to political and economic leaders, that will be the future of our economy and the future of our political system. We want to rebuild back uh, democracy, however we define it, representative government, then equity is the answer. And uh, a human-centered a human focus on equity that is about growing the marketplace, uh, but in a way that leads to human success as well. Thank you for letting us be a part of this, uh, this session these two days. Good day.